Hi everyone. Uh, today we are here speak, uh, with the Willamette University and uh, uh, glad that uh, we could do this session with uh, Professor Jake Ho Hoskins. And uh, uh, today we are going to speak about uh, theory to ROI, how data science transforms business. And uh, at the Willamette University, uh, we believe that it is committed committed to preparing students for leadership and management roles in business, government, and nonprofit organizations. This commitment is uh, uh, featured in their mission statement and their programming as well. Uh, today we have Professor Jay Hoskins, uh, who's the associate professor of data science and marketing, and Tony, who's the director of recruitment MBA programs. Uh, hi, hi both. Uh, Professor Hoskins will help us today to discover how business organizations leverage big data in their decision-making process and the analytic skills MBA graduates need to develop successfully uh, in the business strategies. Uh, thank you for joining us today uh, and uh, for the introductory session on the foundation of data science for a managerial perspective. And let's find out how data science dual degree and uh, 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 data science and MBA program is the right move for the uh, student's career. So hi, both of you. And uh, uh, the stage is all yours. Uh, Professor Jake and Tony, please, please go ahead and share your insights with the both, all of us. Yeah, I'll just introduce myself one more time. Yeah, I'm Tony Castanario. I'm the director of recruitment here for the MBA programs. And I'm going to kind of let Jake uh, kick this thing off. Excellent. Thank you, um to both of you and, and I look forward to speaking on this topic and, and look forward to any questions to follow. So I'd encourage everyone to, to drop any, you know, quick comments into the chat, any questions, and, and Tony will monitor that as we go. And then there will be time at the end to have more uh, in-depth discussion. So I've gone ahead and shared the screen. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and jump into the, the presentation. And, and before I really get into uh, the meat of it, I sort of want to, introduce the idea that um, I'm going to talk about this at a real high level from a theoretical perspective um, and think of this as if you were to come into a class at Atkinson Graduate School of Management, what would kind of the first day be like where you get an idea of what am I going to learn in this class and then and I think of each of these slides might be something that you might spend a whole day on down the road to really get into more depth, maybe get some hands-on experience and learn how to do these things. So that, that kind of gives some framing on the front end. Uh, and then the second thing I'd like to, to note up front is that while I'm talking here about the foundations of data science, I'm really talking about these from the perspective um, of a business and of managers. So really sort of how do we leverage data science to make better business decisions? And that's really where this is coming from. Um, as, as you may or may not know at this point, uh, we do have some unique offerings at the school in that some students choose the path of doing a dual degree in the MS in data science and the MBA. So they, they, they actually do uh, two master's degrees while here. And then we have many other students that, that, that do something partway in between that maybe they get an MBA and then they're able to pick and choose some different electives and courses on these topics to, to sort of uh, build their own a curricular pathway forward. So just to give you an idea of the options. Okay, so let's jump into it. Um, First of all, the, just the big idea, just thinking about data and making decisions. And, and one of the things I like to talk about it in my courses is, is that, you know, data is nothing necessarily new. And, and in fact, you can like really think about data as just sort of information, right? And, and if you think about your day-to-day -day life, we all use data and making decisions. Sometimes it's informal. Data might just be simply, um, I've had a prior experience and interaction in a, in a family relationship, friend relationship, a prior interaction as a consumer as I make decisions, prices, making decisions in terms of product quality. Uh, and, and we often kind of update our decision making over time. So then we talk about that as being the formation of managerial intuition. That because I have experience as a manager in business, I've made many decisions over time. I form kind of this basis of managerial intuition. And for a long time, we sort of trusted uh, those managers to make intuitive decisions based on, on their gut because they knew business. And, and that's kind of how things were done for a long period of time. But, but, but that's shifted a little bit. And I think this quote uh, does a good job of 
uh, summarizing this shift in perspective, quote, gut decisions, which were once seen as inspired if they succeeded, are now viewed as rash. To command authority, you need the numbers to back you up. So more and more organizations, key decision makers, um, really the whole team, right, to get uh, buy-in and, and, and keep support high is looking for their, their leaders, their managers to not only have experience and command and intuition, but also have some hard objective information, some hard data uh, to back up that decision at the same time as well. So I think that's a, a nice kind of uh, starting point. <clears throat> so, so one thing that I see when I teach these courses, especially when I teach um, maybe more experienced MBA students, those that come back to uh, school with several years experience is a lot of times they're saying, okay, yeah, I know we need data to make decisions, but when my organization tries to do this, we, we fail. We don't, we don't really know how to, we don't know what to do. So, so what are the elements needed to do this successfully? And at a real high level, the, these are the big things. So first of all, you need top management support. So you can have whatever resources within the organization, you got whatever excitement, um, going on but if you don't have that buy-in from from upper management it's going to be very hard to push things forward a second thing is you need a, a, an overall supportive analytics culture a lot of times you see things like a certain team uh, goes and hires an analyst or they invest in some data uh, but there's not really cross-functional buy-in or there's not again not top management support or or maybe there's so much day-to-day -day work that there's not time to dive into the data and really get some value from it. Uh, all of those elements kind of come to the idea of a supportive uh, analytics culture. You need IT support. This is uh, uh, somewhat an obvious one, but, but it's also one that's often missing. Like we want to do this in the abstract, but do we actually have the technical resources in place? Do we have the, the technology, the people to, to technically do this? <laughs> You, of course, need appropriate data. If you haven't gone out and collected good data, you can do all the analysis you want. It's not very valuable. <laughs> and lastly, you need the analytic skills. So, of course, you know, kind of thinking uh, somewhat selfishly here, uh, many of you are maybe thinking, can I be training up and getting the analytic skills so I can add value to, to organizations on this fifth component, right? So that that's, that's another key aspect here as well. <laughs> I also like to zoom out here and, and talk a little bit about a growing opportunity in business uh, for those who really like this stuff. And, that, and that's maybe to become something like a chief data officer, right? So that's a, that's a growing role that's out there that many organizations are looking for. There have been chief information officers. There have been chief technology officers. They tend to be more on the back end computer science, software type, type side. The chief data officer is similar but it might be a little bit more forward on the business side, kind of working with IT and, and sort of saying, how do we make decisions with data? Um, if I were ever offered a role for a chief data officer or if a student of mine was ever offered a role as a chief data officer and, and they asked me a question, what should I be over? What should I do? Um, or, or even the better question is, this organization has never had one before and they want to have a chief data officer and they want me to be this. Um, what do I need to find success in this role? Um, and, and from my perspective, you need these four things to be, if not directly under you, you need these four things to be very influenceable by you. You need to have influence over these aspects. So data governance, dashboards, reporting, research and analytics, strategy and innovation. <laughs> Excuse me. And data governance is really everything from how do we kind of keep data high quality, keep data integrity. Uh, this is everything from IT security to um, just processes to input and, and export data successfully without um, manipulating it. Because you're going to have multiple hands, you're going to have multiple individuals working with data in your organization, and they're going to be adjusting it, changing it. How do you maintain those original copies uh, in, in pure form while, while people are working with it? That's data governance. Dashboards and reporting is, is generally not high level analysis. It's not very sophisticated, but what it generally is, is, is quick, easy to digest, fast reports of information of very relevant KPIs or key performance indicators. 
that are are coming to the desks of decision makers, middle level managers, upper level managers on a continual basis. It doesn't take a lot of data science analytics, high level analysis, but it but it actually is very influence uh, very influential within many organizations because you know, a middle manager ultimately just wants to know did our sales grow over the last quarter? Did it grow more in this region versus that region? And those types of data points are, are very important. Chief data officers should really be thinking about uh, how to manage that process. Research and analytics is maybe more deep dives. Okay, region regional sales did change here versus there, but maybe the question of why, why was it changing more here versus there? Was it something related to our strategic approach or was it something more related to the nature of that region? It, you probably want to be over that more sort of deep dive, exploratory, finding out key ideas, generating insights. That's kind of maybe what we think more of being data science. That's research and analytics. And then lastly, if you're doing all this effort to sort of invest in data, have quality information, to be flowing information throughout the, the organization and, and researching it, you want to make sure that you have an avenue as a chief data officer to link this to the key decisions of the organization or to things like strategy and innovation. You don't want to be siloed. You want to make sure that you have a seat at the table that you can link this to all the other key uh, decisions being made. <clears throat> so let's move forward. Another big topic I, I really like to cover in my, my courses on data science and analytics and, and related topics is the idea of data quality and, and data integrity. This is something that maybe is not featured enough. It's maybe put in the back burner. We, we kind of get excited about, oh, we're going to analyze stuff. We're going to find things out. I find students are really excited about that aspect. But big rule here to keep in mind is if I have poor data that I'm working with or incomplete or insufficient or inaccurate, it does not matter how advanced or how sophisticated my analysis is. I will get incorrect insights. If the data being analyzed is incorrect, I cannot adjust that. By contrast, if I have pretty good data that I'm working with, it's high quality, it's, it's accurate. <clears throat> and I do relatively naive or limited or, or not very sophisticated analysis. I just do some simple summary statistics. I'll actually get some valuable information out of that. Sure, I might be able to get more valuable information if I go to more sophisticated things and I count for more factors, but I'm actually going to get much further along by having quality data with simple analysis than the opposite, poor quality data with very advanced analysis. <clears throat> I see a question in the chat. <clears throat> as mentioned, please toss those in there and, and I'll, I'll come back and, and hit those all at the end uh, as, they, as they come up. <clears throat> Okay, let's uh, jump forward. Uh, another thing I like to bring up here is is the idea of this sort of pyramid. Uh, thinking about if I'm if I am an organization and I invest in in being more analytical, I mean data science be more a part of what I do in, in driving business decisions. Um, if you kind of look at the landscape of organizations out there, uh, where are they? Many organizations are doing reporting. Most organizations I would say are doing reporting, even kind of going to small organizations without a lot of resources. Um, and, and then a good number have moved up to KPIs and dashboards. And so reporting is something as simple as we're actually paying attention to sales figures. We're paying attention to how many employees we hired last year versus this year, uh, things like those. And then KPIs and dashboards is not only are we paying attention to and measuring things and, and, and driving it into our decision-making, but we've actually gotten together and we've agreed upon what decision points, what data points are most important and should be fed to decision makers in a, in a digestible way. Those are generally dashboards. A lot of organizations have gotten these two uh, building blocks in place, at least to some degree. Doesn't mean they can't go back and, and, and refine them further. And I think when I talk to many students and I talk to many organizations, I often find there's, there's refinement that can be done here. And I often suggest get that in order before you kind of worry about the upper upper blocks. Because if you're working with the wrong KPIs, you're doing the wrong advanced analysis when you move up higher. 
Right, so this is kind of the way you want to think about building it up. And then as you move up, of course, we're kind of getting into uh, really the buzzwords and the, the exciting things going on, like AI, predictive analytics, and so on. Um, realistically, not every organization has gotten to this place and has done this well. And, and in fact, when you look at like the landscape of small to mid-sized organizations, the most common thing you hear is, I think I should do this. All my competitors are doing this, but I haven't figured out how to have time. And it's sort of re it's, the, the reality is that most organizations think everyone else is much further along on this than they are. So everyone's a little bit scared that they're behind. Realistically, outside of you know real big heavy re resource uh, organizations that we kind of think of, you know the, the biggest multinationals, a lot of small and mid-sized are, are have not quite figured out how to do this top end of the pyramid yet. <clears throat> Again, running through big topics, and and once again, these would be the, the major things you might hit in, in a course um, here at Atkinson. Uh, theory and data. Um, I, I give this this simple visual, and and along with the visual, I give this backdrop. If <clears throat> um, here in the United States, one of the principles of our primary school education is at some point. In tenth grade, 11th grade, uh, and every student is required to learn basically the scientific method in some capacity. So I can give this this talk and and most of my students that are here domestic will say, yeah, I remember this. And basically, we have to set up a science experiment in, in kind of a hard science class, but whether that be chemistry or whatnot where we have a hypothesis on the front end, we collect some information, we run some experiment, then we record whether or not this hypothesis was true or not. And it's kind of the traditional scientific method. How do we find out information with data? And, and this process starts with theory and then it uses data to test the theory. So it's theory with an error to data. If you look out there in, in industry, um, oftentimes, that has been reversed. So many organizations and data science in particular has sort of said, let's let's get rid of our preconceived notions or ideas of what we think will happen, these hypotheses, and let's just go let the data speak. Let's let the data tell us what's happening. So they actually go data, arrow to theory. And there's actually a, a relatively lively and heated debate on, on which approach is right uh, out there. And I am personally of the belief that it's it's a um, a bit of a silly debate. It's an incorrect debate to have because the reality is both approaches have some real blind spots. So if we start with theory and move to data, um, the blind spot there is is you may be a little bit too subscribed to your original preconceived notions the original theory, and you may be more likely <clears throat> to dismiss an unexpected finding in the data. By contrast, if you if you start with no theory and you run right to the data, you don't really have any additional initial context, and you can search extensively in data and spend a lot of time and a lot of resources doing so. And you also can end up with really just findings that are unlikely to generalize or persist over time. So I always give this example in my classes, we have the Nike World Headquarters just nearby campus uh, here in, in one university nearby our, our downtown Portland campus. And I always give the example of, let's imagine you have this really sophisticated analysis and your data science department has done this and you're at Nike and you find that colored running shoes bright colors, bright yellow, bright purple, bright orange. They've been selling in increasing pace over the last five years. And so now the recommendation is let's revamp our whole running shoe line to be, all be bright colors. And I ask students to kind of go back and forth and tell me whether or not it's a good idea. And, and, and I actually do a role play where I'm the data science uh, department that's presenting these information. And oftentimes students really kind of talk about, you know, they try to 
ask me questions on the analysis. Was the analysis done right and whatnot? And I would say, no, it's done right. Uh, are you comfortable with this recommendation? And and really what we get to after this role play is, well, it turns out that the analysis is not the problem here. The problem is whether or not fashion trends are changing in the future, which is not going to be in prior data. Right. So it's very possible that the last five years, colored shoes were very fashionable. And now next year, colored shoes are no longer fashionable. And so you're actually going to need um, some sort of theory there to really understand what's going to happen in the future. And the theory that makes sense is that fashion trends change and they change quickly. So you probably can't make a decision entirely on prior sales data in that context, because you probably also need some indicator of fashion trends and, and fashion forecasting. <clears throat> a little visual here. Uh, big data is is a term I use to sort of just kind of summarize most of what we do in data science, where we're collecting lots of information as an organization. We generally have large archives. And, and I like to contrast this from a scientific perspective, because again, what is data science? It's really sort of taking scientific methods, more advanced research methodologies and trying to put them into practice in an industry setting. Um, how does big data compare to something like a lab experiment uh, and then in between a field experiment? And wh why does this matter? Oftentimes in, in, in research, we think about lab experiments as sort of being the gold standard as giving us the mo most pure information uh, so if you look at medical research, oftentimes when they when they first have a finding showing up in, in kind of field data or big data, um, they then want to see if it actually holds up in an experimental context before they're willing to uh, really say, yes, this is a medical finding. And, and why is that? Well, when we get more towards big data, we have more practical implementation and external validity, but we lose some of the benefits of a lab experiment, which is that you have a lot of control as a researcher and you have a lot of internal validity. And my next couple of slides will sort of give you an idea of why that is. And it sort of gives you an idea of the challenges, but also the opportunities of working with, with big data. So let's give you a, a context sticking in this uh, medical domain. Um, where you can sort of think about the idea of maybe I want to know if sunscreen, when applied to skin, uh, can reduce skin cancer rates? This is kind of a, a natural question that would matter. Um, and if I were in a lab experiment context, this would be pretty easy as a researcher to design an experiment. I would say, grab up 100 people that are willing to, to engage in the uh, experiment and randomly assign 50 of them to wear sunscreen, 50 of them not to wear sunscreen. Um, over their lifetime and then see uh, the, the difference in skin cancer rate. Now, in theory, that's really simple. Of course, realistically, you wouldn't be able to do this because no one would actually uh, agree to, to engage in this lifelong experiment, but we can sort of see why it would make sense. And what randomization does is it sort of cancels out the common variables between those two populations so it isolates just, did you have the treatment or not? And in this case, did you receive sunscreen or not? And so now we can pretty comfortably as a researcher say that the difference in observed outcome, uh, skin cancer rate in this case, is actually attributed to, to the sunscreen application or not. <laughs> and so that's, that's the idea of experimental control by experimentally assigning by assigning to two groups, the experimental group and a control group through randomization, we're actually able to control for the other variables. And you can do this with a simple mathematical uh, representation that all other variables are, are, are what we call a Z vector. They go into the same um, bin and we can cancel them out. They're on both sides of the equation. <clears throat> But in the wild, when you're working with big data, you don't have this luxury. So you can't actually put people into uh, different groups here. What you actually see happen is different people use sunscreen at different rates. Different people are susceptible to skin cancer at different rates. So when you correlate these two variables, you don't really know what all happened here. So that it gets a little messier. 
And when you think about this context, I'm actually going to back up a sec. When you think about this context, there's actually a, a very likely what we call confounding variable, which is that if I live in a region that has more sun exposure, it's much more likely I apply sunscreen and it's also much more likely that I may be susceptible to skin cancer. Or in other words, there is a Z variable that drives both my my choice to apply sunscreen and my risk of skin cancer. So if you just correlate these variables and see if there's a relationship, while you naively expect them to be negative, more sunscreen would reduce skin cancer rate. Because sun exposure might drive both, that might either reduce the strength of that effect or it could even flip it where maybe you would see that on average people who are using more sunscreen are actually getting skin cancer at higher rates because they are in these regions where sun is stronger and 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 more prevalent <clears throat> that of course would be a, a surprising finding but you can kind of see how it would occur so when working with big data you can't rely on what we call experimental control and you need something called statistical control. So one of the real common approaches to, to deal with this is a regression analysis, but there's many other techniques and modeling techniques, but this one is probably the easiest to illustrate in a, in a short time frame like this, where if I'm looking at the isolated effect of sunscreen usage rate on skin cancer rate, I need to actually identify and statistically control for the other factors like so. So maybe I have rate of sun exposure. I measure that and partial out its effect. Other health risks. Maybe there's a bunch of things there. Maybe there's demographics. And by accounting for these other factors statistically, I now can find the sort of leftover effect that's a direct impact of sunscreen usage on skin cancer. And so that's that's the idea of data science. And you can sort of see that that's going to be a lot of work. You have to, first of all, identify what all these factors are. You need to analyze them successfully. And then it turns out there's a lot of uh, technical things here where you need to watch out for cross correlations and whatnot. And so that's why you can have um, quite a bit of effort to uh, to dive into this topic and, and become a, a skilled expert here and, and why a lot of organizations can't simply just collect data and have findings, they probably need some people to do some more sophisticated analysis to really get the best insights. Because without that sophisticated analysis, you might make an incorrect decision if you just ran a simple scatter plot or a, skip, a simple summary statistic between these two variables in this case. <clears throat> All right, last two topics for today, and then we'll open up to Q&A. Um, I just want to reiterate why sample size matters. Uh, this is a simple simulation. If any of you are interested, you can run this simulation. Uh, if you have a program like Microsoft Excel, you can do a, a random number function and you can do um, zero or one. And then you can pull that down um, several hundred rows and you can just see zero being a tails flip, one being a head heads flip, and you can simulate coin flips. And if you kind of take yourself out of um, your situation where you know that a coin being flipped is likely to land on heads or tails 50% of the time, let's imagine that you have just come to the world. You don't know this. You flip a coin once, it lands on tails. You could conclude, oh, if I flip a, a coin, it will always land on tails 100% of the time. Or in other words, that's what's being uh, concluded if I only have a sample size of one. And you can see if I flip the coin five, ten times, in this case, I then say, oh, it lands on heads 15% of the time. Clearly, these are big misses from the reality of 50%. In this case, we have the luxury of knowing the true value of 50%, and we can actually see the error in real time. <clears throat> And as we move along and we get to say like a hundred flips, now we're starting to get a lot less noise because the randomness has been canceled out. 
the flip, the misses on the head side, the misses on the tail side from the reality of halfway in between are canceling one another out. And we, we are starting to get a much smoother understanding of the true value. And over time, this will go, um, if you had enough flips, it will get to 50% or be very, very close, like 50.2 or 49.8. And, and this principle is, is simple, it's understandable, but it, it also sort of re-illustrates why collecting more information, having more sample is really valuable for organizations and really kind of drives home this idea of having investment in data resources, of having big data and really diving in with um, more analysis to really get the best insights. Last comment of the day, um, big miss that I see a lot of organizations do is that they they collect a bunch of information, they have a bunch of data, they have a bunch of skilled analysts to go analyze that data, and, and they, they sort of cut them loose. But those analysts don't have an understanding of the business context. And so they start working with variables. They start working with, oh, I have sales growth, and I have price points, and I have uh, advertising and I have, you know, whatever it may be. Without a linkage of those data points to actual business constructs, we can't link the analysis to our knowledge as business people uh, of, of theory of likely uh, linkages and so on. So you always want to think about the, the variables you have is your metrics. And you always want to think about the things that you, you care about is your constructs. So I'll give you a, a nice example here. In marketing, <clears throat> we all know that brand equity matters. It's, a, it's an important variable in the marketing equation, brand equity being the value of your brand. So we talk about it. It's linked into a bunch of marketing concepts. If I have more brand equity, I'll be able to drive more sales. If I have more brand equity, I'll on more loyal customers. And we have all these expectations around brand equity. If I produce the same advertisement, more people are going to respond to that advertisement by brand equity. Well, it turns out that that all makes sense. But how do you actually measure brand equity? Well, for a long time, we were measuring it as a price premium, that if I had two t-shirts and I had a gray t-shirt with no logo on it, an unbranded gray t-shirt, and then I had this gray t-shirt with, say, a Nike logo on it, coming back to our example from earlier, we might expect that the Nike t-shirt could command a higher price at market. And the difference in that price commanded might be an indicator that that brand has more value. But that was sort of agreed upon. But over time, we, we, we started to realize that that failed to fully capture the concept of brand equity, because there's many valuable brands that that provide value and they're clearly important brands, but they do, don't do so by, by having a price premium. And, you know, an example here is with low cost airline carriers. Uh, these have popped up around the world, Ryanair in, in, in Europe, Southwest Airlines in the United States, where they generally are at a lower price point, but they're very, very valuable brands. They have really high uh, customer satisfaction, customer loyalty rates, and, and so on things we think about that. And so it turns out that moving to the, the ability to generate more revenue or more sales is maybe a better way of measuring uh, brand equity and capturing this construct. So nice example there, a thing to think about. <clears throat> That's all I have prepared. So I'd be happy to turn to Q&A and, and whatever the, uh, the remaining session is, is utilized for. Thank you, Professor Jake, for taking out time and you know taking up, uh, taking us through this presentation. Uh, before we move on to the Q and A, I wanted to check with you if there are any live uh, uh, projects that you and your students must have done, and would you would you like to share those uh, experience and details with us? Any any projects related to data science? I didn't quite capture the yeah. question. Yeah. yeah. Um. So, so one of the things that I've done uh, the last few years is I teach an elective on marketing analytics, and we've actually engaged in the Adobe Analytics Challenge. You can look that up online, where we actually have an opportunity to dive into um, a a real client's data set. Um, 
we did a Nike a few years ago. We did Disney a couple years ago where they give you about two to three weeks to jump into their real resources of data and, and answer two to three research questions in a challenge format. And we actually had a, a student team make the top six, make the final round just a couple years ago out of over 4,000 entrants. So that was, you know, obviously a great, great experience, really hands-on, a really fun experience and, and a nice achievement for the school. Great, great. Uh, so moving on to the questions in Q&A box that we have between uh, from some of the students. Uh, so one question is, uh, is big data analytics also part of data science? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, absolutely. Um, and I would say if you are operating out there, there is loose usage of these terms. Some use these terms interchangeably. I think that's a not quite right personally um, analytics is sometimes utilized to talk about sort of deep dive analysis analytics is also sometimes used to talk about fast flowing information driving decisions um, i believe analytics should cover both of those topics personally but you don't always see it done that way and then uh, data science is generally used more on the deep dive analysis side. So I think that that's, that's probably an accurate usage of, of data science is really sort of thinking about how do I do like the sophisticated, really advanced analytical aspects of analytics. Sure, sure. And uh, also, if you can just highlight a little on the job opportunities if a student is doing the dual program of MB and data science, uh, what kind of a growth he can expect? Or in fact, the students are asking here about the uh, idea on the compensation, but uh, if you can name some of the industry players where they can uh, uh, get a job later on, that'll be really helpful. Yeah, yeah, I would be happy to. So, you know, one thing that is nice, the advantage that Willamette University does have from my vantage point, is kind of just the wealth of organizations in town and, and the, the development of the uh, corporate base. Um, Portland's a, you know, a big city, but it's not a huge city, uh, kind of being the largest metro market nearby. And they have, from my vantage point, an abnormal number of big companies. You think about the big athletic apparel companies like Nike, Adidas has its North America headquarters there. But you have quite a other quite a lot of other development as well. You have financial services as a big base. Um, you of course have government and whatnot as well. So there's a lot of corporations there. In terms of thinking about what sorts of roles you can do, it, I see a pretty big variety, right? So I, I see a good number of students that that do something like they specialize in finance and they grab some electives in analytics. Now they're going the route of financial analyst. By contrast, some people do a little bit more marketing and, and, and analytics. Now they're going the route of marketing analyst and kind of moving up that route. Uh, and then other students go the route of, I want to be kind of pure data science. And, and then they move up towards, you know, the route of being a data scientist or, or maybe they jump the aisle a little bit into things like data engineering, data architecture, and so on, which if you maybe, for example, came with an undergraduate in computer science, and then you came and did uh, this type of master's, you'd be pretty well positioned to do those types of uh, roles as well, which is instead of doing the analysis to generate insights, you're you're more kind of on the back end, making sure the data is flowing successfully, and making sure the data science say data scientists have what they need to be successful, and and actually from my vantage point, that's that's kind of the uh, log jam in a lot of organizations. Like we have analysts, but we don't know how to get the data to all kind of flow through successfully. So there's you know right now maybe a lot of opportunity in that space as well. Sure, sure. We understand. Um, another question, interesting question on the chat. Uh, does the MBA course also cover some capstone project which, he which helps understand the core application of data science techniques and also help relate insights to business requirements? Yeah, so there's no formal capstone course on that right now, but what we have is a pretty healthy range of electives. Um, 
that you can kind of pick and choose from. So, you know, we have managing with AI on, on the books right now. I mentioned I teach marketing analytics. Um, we have management analytics on the books. So there's maybe as you go along, you have the opportunity to choose a lot of different electives to sort of move from theory to application in kind of the route you want to. If you do the MBA route, if you do the MS in data science, they they have a formal capstone over there. So that that's where you would get the formal camps capstone. Understood. Um, one last question before we uh, move on and speak with Tony. Um, so if it's like there are uh, uh, different degrees like MBA in business analytics and MBA in data science and the content of both the programs are somewhat similar. So uh, does it does it really matter uh, what student is choosing as the course preference or both of these land up to similar kind of job opportunities in the later stage? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the, the terms are somewhat interchangeable. Business analytics is, is uh, I view as probably the, the term that's used most commonly for like application of data science to business. Um, so that's that's used a lot out there. I, I think that you are doing it correctly to look at curriculum and sort of what are the underpinnings rather than relying just on the naming of the degree. I think that's that's smart and that's the the right way to go about it. Uh, so on the surface, if it's named one or the other, I don't think that would be your your core criteria. I definitely look under the hood. Understood. Sure. So uh, thank you, Jake. Uh, it was really insightful uh, uh, information from you. Uh, over to Tony. And uh, Tony, I would like you to kind of uh, take us through a little on the admission process and some of the informations uh, regarding the uh, MBA and the dual program. That'll be really insightful. Yeah, absolutely. So the admissions process, if you wanted to apply for the dual degree program, is really like applying just for the MBA. You're going to have to meet all of the MBA requirements and your first year in the program, you're actually starting in the MBA and then you're starting to take those elective courses. There's like one option in your first year and then, or, or sorry, in your first year in the spring term. And then once you get into your second year, that's when you really start to take all those data science courses. So when you apply, it's a free application. I know that we got that in the chat. There's a lot of questions, uh, no charge. So whether you apply just for the MBA or you're applying for the MBA and, and uh, data science program, does not cost you anything. Uh, process is going to end up being the same for both, whether you apply for just MBA or MBA, MSDS. So online application, you're going to have to have two references. Uh, any references uh, could be a professor, could be somebody that was a supervisor, somebody you worked with, a friend, just as long as it's not a relative. And then you have to write a personal statement, you know, why the MBA and MSDS program? What are you looking for? What are your short and long-term goals? Doesn't have to be any more than a page. And other requirements that we have, um, it's going to tell you on our website for international students that we require a WES transcript evaluation. We have the ability to waive that requirement. So we always tell students, if you already have like an IEE, uh, transcript evaluation, we will take that, especially with students that are working with GradWrite. Um, if GradWrite is telling us that you've kind of been through the transcript evaluation process or they've evaluated or we we know these institutions, that's usually good enough for us and we will waive that WES requirement. If you already have the WES transcript evaluation, we'll accept it. If you have an unofficial copy of it, we'll accept that as well. Um, eventually we will need official transcripts on record, but unofficial transcripts for the initial admissions process are fine. Um, <clears throat> then every applicant needs to interview with us. And the interview process is not to weed students out. I know students often ask us, why do we have to interview? And it's because we want to get to know you. And we think that you're going to get to know our program better by asking more questions and having that interview helps both the student and us try to find out what you're looking for and how we can help you. So the interview is not uh, like a job interview at all. It's much more conversational. So what are your goals? What are you trying to accomplish? What does our program have that you're looking for? And how can we help you? And oftentimes you will learn a lot through the interview process about us. You'll be able to ask a lot more questions. And you're gonna also work with probably myself or one of my other colleagues in the application process. So 
that's uh in a nutshell that's that's kind of how it begins you work with grad right we have a, a twenty thousand dollar scholarship uh for being a, a grad right applicant so anyone who is here on this webinar uh you're working with grad right you learned about us you, you're talking to grad right at all you're going to apply and if you get admitted we have that twenty thousand dollar automatic scholarship so the application process there's nothing you have to do on the application to apply for that specific scholarship once you let us know that you're working with GradRight and you're applying, you're going to automatically qualify for that. Um, and it's $20,000 per year. So it's a renewable scholarship. So hopefully that answered that and other questions with the application, happy to answer. Um, just two more questions that I have. Uh, first is for uh, uh, the English requirement that we need. Uh, do the students need to submit the official uh, report or... Uh, uh, a general report would be okay. Oh yeah, that's a great one. That I did forget that requirement. So yes, the English proficiency requirement. Again, we have the ability to weigh this. Um, and I also did not mention the test requirement, I guess. Uh, I, I had all that in my last slide. So, so the two other, the last two big pieces for international students. Um, most Indian students will, will get back to me and say, I take in courses at an institution that teaches English. And our requirement is really you can get that test waived if you demonstrate that not only do you speak English well, but you have a great understanding. And so through the interview process, sometimes we are able through that interview process to go ahead and say, OK, we will waive that. But in general, what we found through the visa process is that it's it's better to have more paperwork on you uh, than not enough. So we encourage students even if you've taken courses at, a, at an institution that has been taught in English, that you take the English proficiency requirement and we can accept the TOEFL, the IELTS, or the Duolingo. Uh, Duolingo is actually the, uh, the one that we actually have free um, fee waivers for that we can send students. The requirement is to score 105 or higher. And you have plenty of time to take that exam. Um, because we still have a month before our general uh, admissions requirements come up here on May 1st. So you have plenty of time to study up for that exam and we can send you a, a fee waiver for that. And then the other requirement that we have um, is the GRE or GMAT requirement. So we have an entrance exam. So the way the uh, entrance exam works is you do not have to have a certain score to get into our program. It's it, There is no minimum score requirement. The reason why we have students take the exam is to not only demonstrate knowledge, but really it's to help you with earning more scholarship money. And so for international students, the more scholarship money you can earn, that's usually the number one priority for all students. And so the way you earn the highest scholarships from us is by taking that entrance exam and scoring as well as you can. And if you are a quantitative person and you really like math and you're good at entrance exams, the GMAT is the exam that you will want to take. Um, if your quantitative skills need more polishing, uh, we suggest to take the GRE and it's going to be broken up with a verbal section. And, and here's where, you know, you're asking about the English proficiency. And this is why I'm talking about both exams. If you score really well in the verbal section of, or, um, of the GRE exam, oftentimes we can waive your English proficiency requirement by pointing to those kind of scores. Um, but again, as a, as a number one rule, I always recommend that you take an English proficiency exam so you have that documentation when you get into your visa appointments in case you get a consulate who says, have you taken the exam? And we've had that before in the past. So we encourage students to take both. Sure. And uh, uh, does the university accept a three-year degree? Absolutely. So we accept three-year degrees from Indian institutions. And uh, um, what I tell students, the other questions that I was trying to answer, multiple questions in the Q&A, uh, what if I don't have any business experience? What if I don't have any data experience? In this MBA program, you do not need to have any business courses under you. So if you were, if you majored in engineering or you majored in, um, you know, any other major, okay, you were getting into healthcare, you were, whatever it is, we start from ground zero. So in this program, you're going to gain experience as well. That was the other question that kind of followed up. You don't have to have business courses under your belt. 
nor do you have to have uh, work experience. And so you gain experience while you're in this program. We have what's called experiential learning and consequential learning courses so that you can put these kind of things on your resume by taking certain courses. Some of our courses deal with real money, real situations. And we also take a cross sectoral approach uh, in this program, uh, we're duly accredited for profit and not for profit state and government work. So we have some students that come here primarily because they want to start not for profits or they're interested in that kind of work. And you're going to be cross trained. And that's a, another really unique thing about Willamette University's MBA program. You don't have to have experience. You're going to gain experience while you're here and you're going to be cross trained in for profit, not for profit work. And you're going to have uh, a six month long project in a mandatory class that you have to take in this program, we're going to be working with a not-for-profit. And that's just one example of an experiential learning class that you can put on a resume that you can talk to employers when you're doing job interviews that you've done this and here's what you've done. And so not just pointing to theory, but showing application that, hey, I've done this work in the classroom and here, and here was the real world experience we had. So hopefully that answered that as well. Yes. Um, before we end the session, there's just one last question that uh, I would like to speak about. Uh, so we were speaking on the scholarship front and uh, you mentioned about the 20,000 scholarship uh, for graduate students. Uh, what is an average scholarship uh, that the university provides and maybe what is the uh, potential of a maximum scholarship that a student can earn uh, if he's having a decent GRE or a GMAT score? Yeah, that's a great question. So I would say on average, we're probably half the tuition costs, you know, 40% ish between 40 and 50%. Uh, and then if you score really well on the GRE or GMAT, so if you're above the 88th percentile in either of those exams, so you're looking at um, closer to the 700 mark on the GMAT and then the, the GRE and the GMAT both kind of revamped the way they do their scoring and the tests both used to be like almost four hour tests. Now they're both right around two hours. So the exams aren't that bad anymore, uh, but it's both, you want to look more at the percentile versus the actual uh, scores. Now that the scores have changed. So if you're in the 88th and above percentile, you're looking at full tuition type scholarships. So we do have uh, students that are getting those every year. And um, what I would tell you is, you're a grad right applicant, you're guaranteed the 20, which is basically 40, right? Because you're gonna get 20 over two years. But again, if you do really well on those tests, um, you're gonna earn yourself a full tuition scholarship. And if you're on the average, you're looking at you know 40%, 50% of tuition costs. That's what you can expect. That's, that's a great amount of scholarship. Thank you for that. Um, yes. yes. Uh, I hope that uh, you know there are no further questions from the students and uh, uh, thank you. We are, we are also running short on time. So yeah, thank you, Tony and uh, Professor for taking our time today to meet our students and have an engagement session with them. I would also be uh, sharing this uh, uh, Zoom video with the students who have registered and who could not join us today. And uh, uh, looking forward to have a great fall intake and uh, would obviously be sharing uh, information regarding more queries if we have going forward with uh, uh, Tony with you. And uh, you can obviously answer them and we can we can share them with the students. Uh, thank you again for taking out time. And uh, uh, yeah, is there anything else that you would like to uh, convey to the students here? Yeah, the one thing I would like to say is if you're interested in applying, do not wait. Uh, we want you to apply as soon as possible. May 1st is kind of our general deadline. We will accept applications after that, but the real focus for international applicants is getting through the visa process. And so we encourage students, get your applications started, get rolling as soon as possible. Um, if you're a little bit late past May 1st, you're working with GradRight, you don't have to panic. We will accept your application. It's just getting you through that visa process, making sure we get the paperwork. So in short, apply as soon as possible. And uh, we really, really encourage all of you, if you're interested at all, Go through the process, interview with us, learn a lot more. We have fantastic professors like Jake Hoskins, and we want to help students out. And we would love to have you guys be a part of Willamette University's program. Thank you so much for this. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for taking our time today to uh, learn more about the university and the program. And yes, looking forward to have those applications 
uh, for Willamette University in the upcoming days. And uh, yes, thank you again, uh, Tony and Jake, for taking our time today to speak with the students. Mm -hmm.